right, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For many of you, it's your first time joining us ever. It's still our first full month back. We are on broadcast number 32. It's been a crazy wild ride. And so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, everything we do goes live to YouTube and stays there forever. We've got a bunch of YouTube classes joining us right now, and a big welcome to all of you. If you want to watch this program in three weeks, or three years down the road, you can absolutely do that. Just check it out on the YouTube link below. Lots of opportunities to keep the excitement going. Now, over the summer, every summer, I take the chance to look up the coolest scientists and explorers on planet Earth and beg them to come join me. And there's a topic that I've wanted to have on this broadcast for like five, six years because it's one of the coolest scientific facts and ways of obtaining new information that I've ever learned about in my life. And that is meteorite hunting in Antarctica. So fortunately for all of us, Linda Welsenbach agreed graciously to join us today. She's joining from Rice University in Texas, and she's going to share a little bit about her past exploring one of the most unique places on planet Earth for some of the coolest things on planet Earth. And why on earth would she go there? We're going to find out from her. I'm not going to steal her thunder. I'm so excited to welcome in Linda. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, take us away on this journey. All right, Jesse, thank you so very much. And uh, super excited that I got invited to to give this talk and speak about uh, my experience in Antarctica, collecting meteorites, and you know some of what these really interesting objects can tell us about our solar system's origin. Um, Jesse shared with me a lot of the places where everybody's tuning in today, and I'm super excited to know that there are some watchers from Maryland. Big shout out to the peeps from Maryland because that's where I was born and grew up and actually went to my undergraduate. All right, so I'm gonna start off very quickly, of course, explaining a little bit of how I managed to get to Antarctica. And it all begins at the age of seven. My uncle gave me a mineral specimen. And from there, I started collecting like mad. I went to mineral shows. This is a picture of me on the far left where um, I'm in Reisterstown, Maryland at one of the mineral shows there. I continued to collect all the way through high school and into college, even through grad school. And so I, then was able to discover that there were even positions at the Smithsonian Institution. And I managed to talk my way into um, getting a job there. Um, and from working in exhibits where I basically managed all the specimens that were gonna go into a brand new exhibit, I was able to segue into a job managing the meteorite collections. And um, during the interview where, um, uh, they were asking me, you know, all kinds of questions about how I was going to proceed in this job. One of the ones that they asked me, of course, was, would I be interested in uh, going to Antarctica to collect meteorites? And of course, kind of the rest is history. Um, today, of course, I'm coming to you from Rice University um, in my job as a science communicator. And what I do is I help students and faculty communicate their science. Um, but I still occasionally get to go out and collect meteorites. Um, this is a picture of me and my husband in the center there just in the last year or so. My husband is also a meteorite expert, and so we are kind of the nerd couple. Um, and this is, in fact, the first meteorites that I've collected since I went to Antarctica. And so uh, that picture of me on the far right actually is me at uh, another university. I'm in the process of actually getting my PhD at the age of 67. But anyway, long story short, um, Getting to Antarctica also begins with a really, really interesting story about serendipity. Um, and before I go on, I'm gonna mention that there'll be a couple of times where I'm gonna go ahead and stop and ask everybody, people who are watching to um, answer some questions in the chat and Jesse will help out with this. There's gonna be three places where we do it and um, you'll know, cause I will be asking the questions. Okay. Um, the Antarctic search for meteorites begins about three years before I was born in 1969 with the unexpected discovery of a group of really weird rocks that, sh that were on the ice that really shouldn't be there. Um, they were recovered by um, Japanese um, geodetic survey scientists in an area that is actually managed by um, Japan. In fact, all of Antarctica is sort of divided up into pie pieces and each of those pie pieces is kind of sort of governed by various countries of the world. And most of that is to just do science. Well, in any case, <clears throat> they went back several more times and found more meteorites. And then sometime in the mid seventies, this scientist, Bill Cassidy, who's seen here in the middle, um, decided that maybe perhaps we would have the opportunity to find meteorites for 
the U.S. programs or for U.S. scientists much closer to home. And in fact, um, he applied to the National Science Foundation, got the funding, and in 1976 found the first meteorites in the Allen Hills region of Antarctica. And thus begins 50 years of what we call the U.S. Antarctic Meteorite Program, which happens to be a very unique partnership that includes academia, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, NASA, and the National Science Foundation, which basically runs all the science in Antarctica. And so those are the icons that you see there at the bottom of your screen. All right, and here we go. First question, number one, before I jump into why Antarctica is a very special place to find meteorites, I am interested to know if folks in my audience know what a meteorite is. Ooh, so go so ahead so. and post your answers in the chat. And um, I'm going to sort of, and, and Jesse, you can monitor that and, and tell me what those answers are. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue here visually. Um, these images should help somewhat. It's actually a very, very simple answer. Um, we got anything, Jesse? I was just going to say, so our live classes, I'm going to head to Mr. Laveau's class, Ms. Diggy's class, welcome in you two as well. Um, Mr. Laveau's class, a meteor that has hit the earth. I think that's pretty, pretty that cool. you, Honestly, that's very simply, it is a rock from space. It's a little more nuanced than that, basically. It's material that has survived passing through Earth's atmosphere, which is obviously a, a very fiery uh, sort of uh, event. That, that actually removes a lot of the original meteorite material and successfully lands on the surface of the earth where of course we can find them and pick them up. All right, second question, which is also a sort of a nice follow on logical question. Where do these objects come from in space? Go ahead and someone try to, to answer in the chat if you would. By the way, great chat. You guys are like on the ball, I love it. And uh, YouTubers, Miss Hunter's group, they got it as well. Everyone's got it. We we came in with a very meteorite knowledgeable audience, which is fantastic, Linda. It makes your job easier. Right. All right. Where so, what are some of the answers you're getting? Let's see, Mr. Lavos class. If you guys want to just chime into uh, from the asteroid belt, Mr. Lavos class. Hi guys, welcome into North. There Palm it Beach. is. Yep. Of course, the asteroid belt. There is another place where we could potentially get meteorites too. Anybody? Anybody? Come up Ooh. with that answer. Come on, let's see YouTube. Come from space in general, Ms. Schwarin's math class. Yes. So okay. out there, away in some distant place, asteroid belt. Does anyone else know the other one? All right, here's a hint. Here's a hint, hint, hint. Oh, Kuiper belt just came out. Kuiper belt's a little far and a little okay. difficult dynamically, but okay, potentially. Yeah. You two, All right. solar system. Okay, I'll, we'll leave you to it. <laughs> All right. So that little orange arrow is actually pointing to Mars, and now it may be kind of hard to see. So a lot of the rockier bodies basically deliver rocky material to the surface of the Earth. So we could potentially get meteorites from other planets, and in fact, we do, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, how do we get them to Earth? Well, <clears throat> space is a very complicated mixture of a variety of forces, which can create enough chaos to make objects that are normally traveling in one particular area. And in this area, you can kind of see it up there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that's the asteroid belt with some interesting sort of uh, concentric rings. Um, it can, those forces like you, you, the Yarkovsky drift that you see down there in the lower right, um, along with other gravitational um, and complicated forces can cause those objects to bump into each other and then end up in the inner solar system. And we can kind of see how those dynamic forces are, are operating on these objects in this picture, that uh, this composite picture, picture from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, these are all near Earth asteroids. You can see they've, they're bits and pieces of things and they've been impacted and their surface has been very modified by those, by those forces. All right, um, on to, we're still trying to answer why we have so many, uh, so many meteorites in Antarctica. But before I just talk about that, I'm gonna do it in a very sort of roundabout way um, using this map. Um, this map shows all of the non-Antarctic meteorites that have been recovered since AD 861. And what I want you to really focus on is where all those dots are located. You'll notice that most of the dots are located where there are a lot of people. And there are very few dots in the ocean and there are very few dots in any of the places where either there is a lot of vegetation like uh, rainforests or in places where obviously some of those objects are either lost um, to ice or snow or you know just can't be recovered. Now, 13,000 might seem a lot, but it's really not when, we, when it's compared to against what we recovered from Antarctica, which I will get to in a minute. And more importantly, what I want you to focus on too is the fact that we get 50 metric tons of this rock and, rock and dust per year, and it falls 
everywhere all over the planet. Now, Antarctica has no people, there is no vegetation, but it has been covered with ice for a very, very long time. And here's our third and last question until we get to the very end when you can ask all the questions you want. What do you think might be happening to all the meteorites that have been falling on an ice covered body for millions of years? And we're talking upwards of 10 million years. And so go ahead and put that in the chat. And in the meantime, I'm gonna remind you that humans have been finding meteorites for thousands of years everywhere else on the, on the earth. And yet that 13,000 is only a quarter of everything that we've, recover we've recovered from the ice. And I'll give you that actual number here in a couple seconds. Wow. All right, we're gonna, and, we're gonna open in the chat if anyone wants to chime in. This is what led me to this broadcast. Like this is the reason that we're doing this is that it's such a neat idea, thought process of how we went about figuring this out. Uh, they get frozen in the ice from Mr. Lavogue's class. So, okay, they're encased in ice. We can find them more easily. Uh, that's yeah. great. Okay, so yeah. you, you start off with these logical questions. And in fact, after many decades of, of research and recovery, scientists have actually come up with a pretty good theory um, for why we get so many meteorites in Antarctica or why are we able to find so many of these odd objects in very small places. And here it is, it's a little complicated, but the, sh the, the short answer is yes, they are encapsulated and preserved in the ice. That's number one. They fall everywhere on the ice. The ice then gets buried by you know, additional snow and more ice. They are essentially then carried as the ice moves out from the center of the continent to the, to the margins. And when it um, encounters any kind of subsurface obstruction, that ice has no choice but to move upward. And the catabatic winds that actually make Antarctica such a difficult place to work um, also works really, really well to remove that ice. It's called ablation. And in places where the ice becomes kind of stagnant, those meteorites can build up. We can get hundreds or thousands of meteorites you know, along those stagnant areas of the ice in Antarctica. And uh, sadly, a lot of them probably fall into the ocean, but a lot of other places, um, we've been able to accumulate something in the neighborhood of almost 50,000 meteorites. Um, so the United States basically has been working in Antarctica since the 1970s, as you know. And in that period of time, we've had multiple other programs kind of spring up. You've got the uh, National Institute of Polar Research in Japan, which has also been operating sort of in parallel with us, Korea Met, Euromet, which is a consortium of European countries. Chenere, which I don't have on here, is actually a Chinese organization that's been collecting meteorites. Imagine, though, on this ginormous continent, how many more meteorites um, might be ready to be found. All right. And so I'm sure at this point you're wondering, still wondering, how it is people get to the ice and who are the people that actually do the meteorite hunting. Um, the answer is primarily scientists, um, most of which are very much unlike this turn of the century explorer you see here on the left. Um, many of them, believe it or not, have no camping experience at all, let alone Antarctic camping experience. Um, we are unpaid volunteers. Uh, we're planetary scientists, many of which who actually study meteorites. Um, the team is led by a principal investigator who's usually associated with a with the university, that's the academic uh, arm of, of this project. Um, teams are selected each and every year, brand new. You have to write a letter convincing the PI that this is something you really wanna do. Uh, he turns around and sets up the logistics with NSF um, to, to manage the expedition for the year. And then we also have a mountaineer. This is uh, the, the gentleman that is on the left-hand side and the team that you can see in his reflected glasses. Um, who basically is our safety officer. And uh, he's the guy that keeps us from falling into a crevasse. He keeps all the equipment running. He also basically does all the first aid in case anybody needs it, um, at least minor first aid for the most part. Um, occasionally, we also will take an astronaut. Um, this is uh, astronaut Don Pettit. He went with me on my second trip to the ice. Um, incidentally, he's also, um, I think, on getting ready to take his third trip to ISS. So he's still a very active astronaut and actually a very interesting guy. So the collecting season uh, usually begins in what we call the uh, Austral summer. This is the Southern hemisphere summer. So it's, it's land of the midnight sun, as it were. Um, we usually head out around Thanksgiving or a little bit after Thanksgiving and then come back at the end of January. 
Um, the collecting season is usually six to seven weeks actually on the ice where we're, we're able to look for meteorites, weather permitting. Um, and then uh, the National Science Foundation basically arranges all the travel and the logistics. Uh, up to 12 people where we basically have to physically qualify. And if we don't physically qualify, that is perhaps when we get an astronaut substitute because they are always physically qualified. Um, and they will fly us from wherever we live to Los Angeles and over to Christchurch. And Christchurch is where we prepare for our journey to go to the ice. And our first stop is at this place called the uh, United States Antarctic Program Clothing Distribution Center. And this is where we shop for all of our, what we call extreme cold weather gear, although the shopping is for free. Um, and the reason for that, reason why we got to do it there is because we're actually going to step directly out onto the ice surface um, from the plane. And it's really, really important that when you try all this clothes on and they give you a lot of clothing to wear, um, it has to fit perfectly. And it has to fit perfectly because if you are cold, you're actually a danger to everybody else on the team. And that's, that's super important. Um, and I, one of the things that, that you have to do before you would get on the plane, because this is like any project, weight, or you, when you get on a plane to, to travel anywhere else in the world, weight is really important consideration. And so we have limits. And believe it or not, when I put on all of my gear, I weighed in excess of about 30 pounds. Those goofy bunny boots that basically keep your feet super warm weigh in excess of six pounds total. Um, and it's important because uh, you're going to put all that gear on and then you're sitting there in the New Zealand heat and you're saying, oh, my God, I'm so hot. But then you get off the plane into cold that literally just takes your breath away. It's it's absolutely amazing. Um, all right. From the plane, we get on a thing called the uh, Ivan the Terabus. It's this really large conveyance that is good for, for driving right on the ice. And they take us essentially to McMurdo Station, which is the US Antarctic Meteorite Program's center for all science that occurs in Antarctica. And it's here that we begin the process of becoming true Antarctic explorers. And we start that process by um, gathering and packing all of the gear that we're going to take in the field, all the food we're going to take in the field, because it turns out the ANSMET program is one of the few, what they call very deep field uh, teams. And we get out there and there's probably only the plane that delivers us to the field and the plane that eventually comes to, to take us back out of the field. So we have to make sure that we have everything that we need in case we don't get any resupply. Um, at the top of this uh, blue building that you see here on the left is the grocery store for which you see in the center picture all of the food that we're gonna take. And uh, one of the things that I found remarkably um, uh, disconcerting was that if you look at the sell-by date on the top of every one of those boxes, it's been expired by a year, sometimes longer. And part of the reason for that is uh, the, the materials for all of the field teams are usually, you know, boated from the United States. And it takes a very long time for that, for that, uh, for all those resupplies to, to basically get to Antarctica. Um, but I'm here to tell you that it's okay. You can let those expiration dates go a little, a few days or longer and it ain't gonna hurt you. Okay, we also basically get safety training. Uh, we take ropes courses that we begin in McMurdo Station and then we actually take it out into the field as a live practical. We literally lower someone into a crevasse um, and it's done in such a way that it's unexpected so that we have practice responding in a moment's notice to these kinds of emergencies. And it's all done during this period of, of activity called the shakedown, which we also use to test out, you know, how to put our tents up, all the equipment that we're going to use, making sure that every single bit of it works. Because once again, once we're out in the field, we're going to be relatively isolated. We need to make sure that everything is actually working well. From there, everything gets palletized and packed. Uh, very carefully, and it goes into these really amazing planes. This is a LC-130 Hercules. It's a cargo plane that is basically contracted out by the National Science Foundation. Their primary job is actually shipping fuel back and forth to South Pole, but they will occasionally be able to put deep 
uh, field teams into the deep field, and they can pack a lot of stuff into these planes. And then you can see here the L part of the C is associated with those skis that you see rather than having wheels, which makes this a very versatile plane. It, we can land it just about anywhere um, on the ice. Four hours later, uh, from McMurdo to our to the first uh, leg of our field area, we are now circling over uh, the Beardmore Glacier, which is kind of like a staging area for a lot of um, Antarctic science. And uh, they also have semi-permanent, very well-groomed runways, which actually make it a lot easier for the plane to go in and out, especially when weather, um, which is very unpredictable and can change very rapidly, um, is in play. And uh, I have to say, one of the things that I was not expecting was that right before we actually land, the back of that cargo plane opens up and they dump everything from the cargo hold right onto the ice. And so I was really glad that we were not the ones that were responsible for palletizing and making sure that all of that gear was secure, because, of course, that's everything we need to live on for the next six or seven weeks. And then from there, it's a very frantic, uh, we have to unpack everything and actually put tents up so that we are warm and have ways to feed ourselves because eating is very, very important to keeping warm um, so that we can then pack everything up again onto our sleds and commute to the area where we're gonna go ahead and uh, look for meteorites. All right, and so what is camping in Antarctica? All right, I know that everybody's been thinking about this and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'm gonna start with how the earliest explorers might have managed on the ice. You can see here, this is not too bad. It's a nice tent. It's well secure against 70 mile an hour winds. Uh, I'll note here, let's see, I can put my cursor up here. You'll note that there's a nice flagpole, but there's, there's nothing at the tent, and this is gonna be important in a second. Um, it looks like it might be a little tight for four people, but all in all, amazingly, it hasn't changed in all of that time. In fact, we call this tent the Scott Tent based on Robert Falcon Scott in that early uh, first expedition to the South Pole. Um, one of the main differences are these. These are, uh, I'll show you a little bit more why these are important, but that's mostly because they probably didn't have heat in their tent and we do. And so we have to be able to vent the gases from the stoves that we use to actually heat the tent. Uh, they also probably didn't have garden gnomes as a, as a nice little luxury in their in their camp. Oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that in this, what's going on in this picture? This is me standing in front of the tent. You'll notice that it's a whiteout, and um, blowing snow is one of the main weather issues that we have in Antarctica. And it probably half the days that we are there collecting meteorites, we may have to spend in the tent. And the reason for that is you'll notice you cannot see the ground at all. You can't see any topography. There's lots and lots of bumps and ice and sastrugi is what they're called. There's basically these ice forms, they're, they're frozen, which can basically damage your skidoo or damage you if you happen to fall off your skidoo. And so we, we have to stay at home. And um, one of the things that, uh, we have to do when the snow is blowing like this is I have to dig it out like, I don't know, every hour or so, because if if we let the snow blow, it will cover the uh, vestibule of that tent and you won't be able to get out. Um, here's what the inside of the tent looks like. Uh, it's a little bit bigger than the original 1910, 1913 tent. Uh, it's got a nine by nine floor plan. Amazingly, though, it just sits right on top of the ice. All we do is put a rubber tarp down right on top of the ice and then we secure it with those guy lines. Uh, we do typically have some kind of padding or insulation that makes things a little bit better. Um, and uh, maybe uh, among the two people that are in that tent, we can host a guest or two. And um, uh, the top of the tent, like I mentioned before, has these exhaust ports, but a lot of the heat from the tent rises to there. And so you'll notice we have boots and socks that are kind of hanging there. That's really important because when you get up in the morning and you have to put on your shoes, you want them to be relatively warm. The tent uh, temperature overnight gets down to about 10 degrees. And so we also have to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. And we do that in the tent as well. Now, on the lower right, though, is what we call the solid waste management tent. Uh, we are financially, not financially, we are lawfully and environmentally obligated to remove all of our solid waste. This means all of our trash, all of our recycling, everything basically, we, we, it's, it's like leave no trace for the most part, except for pee. Uh, we can pee directly on the ice, which is just fine. Um, 
because essentially the wind, the catabatic winds and the dryness evaporate uh, that material very quickly. However, I will point out that we also basically use the ice as our primary water source. So we make sure that when we go to the bathroom, we're doing it far downwind of where we actually collect our ice. All right, and on to meteorite hunting. Um, hunting uh, seems like it would be straightforward, but we have a lot of ice to cover. And in fact, we get very, very specific training. Uh, we do it one of two ways. The first way, which is relatively easy, is by skidoo. And in fact, we get very specific guidelines on how to hunt by skidoo. And you can see here, Ralph is telling us that we have to stay in our lanes. We are not allowed to look for meteorites outside of what is directly in front of the nose of our skidoo. And you can see here my, my teammate, James, looking a bit skeptical about this. And in fact, he was probably one of the people that meteorite poached more than anybody else. And it's kind of hard. You see a meteorite and you automatically start driving your skidoo towards that. And so this is what this looks like. Here's everybody lined up getting ready to find a meteorite. And in some places, every dark rock on the ice is a meteorite. And it's absolutely just amazing and exciting. Doesn't matter how many times you find one, you're seeing something for the very first time that no one has ever seen before that was delivered from space. Um, so what happens next is then you stop, you let everybody know that you have found one. Sometimes you do a meteorite happy dance like our PI Ralph Harvey is doing here. Um, and that begins the next dance, which is the meteorite collection dance in which we get very close to the object. We do like most science, you do observation, you write that down, you try not to let your snot sickle drip on the meteorite because you don't want to contaminate it. You take a picture. Uh, we use a device, and I'm sh sorry I don't have a picture of it here. Um, it's a, it's, it actually, are, these devices are the same ones that were actually used on the moon. And they have a catalog number, and they have a grayscale and a scale. So we can basically record all the information about how we found the meteorite in the field, including taking a GPS reading, um, using sterilized tools, and then we put everything into a bag that ultimately gets um, put into a larger container back at camp. Um, and eventually to the United States. But I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Uh, some of the hunting is not so easy. Uh, this is meteorite hunting on, on foot or what we call foot searching or maybe better hands and knees searching. Um, and we and, and moraines are, are something that are um, kind of go in hand with basically the areas of ice that get stagnate. Um, moraine, a moraine is basically a rock that has been ground up by the glaciers as it's moving around some of these mountainous materials. And the meteorites are right along in there uh, with it. And, uh, and, but it's, it's interesting, your eyes get very quickly calibrated to that which is truly a meteorite or that which is different. And so I have here in the center, I hopefully everybody can see this and sort of see the meteorite and see the difference in the meteorite relative to the rest of the rocks. Um, and we find a lot this way. And in some ways it's actually a little bit easier to do it this way because you're out of the wind when you're down on the ground in your hands and knees. Um, needless to say, one of everybody's favorite pieces of equipment are the knee pads and everybody has their own and it's highly suggested that, that, you, uh, that you bring them along. Um, after the six weeks are over, we uh, are ready to head back into McMurdo. And part of the reason for this is because the weather is starting to get worse and worse and worse. We're, we're heading essentially to what we call the austral winter. The weather is less predictable. The daylight is starting to, to change. Um, and they want to basically clear up all the science activities so that they can move everything out to uh, uh, back to New Zealand and, and continue with their fueling of South Pole. Um, from there, the meteorites are essentially put into these insulated containers and they're shipped by boat with all the recycling and the garbage back to the US. Uh, it usually takes about four or five months for it to get there, May-ish timeframe. Um, and from there, and, and it actually that ship lands in California, and from there it's shipped in its very own refrigerated uh, tractor trailer to the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, where the meteorites are then thawed, dried, um, subsampled and characterized and then distributed to scientists all over the world. And of course, there's me holding a particular one. I can't remember why. Um, that was in two th uh, was one of the meteorites that was collected in, in 2012. All right. So what have we learned 
from all of these extraterrestrial survivors that we've gone and picked up in Antarctica. Um, I would say arguably one of the most important discoveries is that we had pieces of the moon and Mars. And much of that discovery is both about the variety and the volume of material that we've been able to bring back from Antarctica, but it's also timing. We just had material brought back from the moon during the Apollo era, all in the late 70s. We also basically had Viking landers in the late 70s. They basically collected data about Mars that you know, we didn't have available to us. Um, we've also basically learned things from these rocks as, our, as our, our analytical techniques have gotten better and better and our ability to date things have gotten better and better. We now have a really solid idea about the age of our solar system, which is four and a half billion years. And then we've also basically looked in these rocks in ways we've never looked at it before. We've actually discovered that there are organic compounds in these rocks. And so they've given us ideas, daring ideas about where life might have come from in the solar system. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on Mars um, and some of that life, some of those life questions, because the Mars question was really interesting. Um, it comes essentially, the, the, the way we found out that we had pieces of Mars comes from this particular meteorite up here, EETA 7901. That meteorite was found in 1979. Viking was on Mars in 1976 and 77. And a scientist, we're, we're going to bring back the whole idea of science and serendipity. There was a scientist at NASA who had basically participated on the Viking mission that looked at data that was recovered from these really weird, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna get my cursor back. Okay, I can't. Um, they're little glassy pockets in EETA 7901 that had atmospheric gases in them. And then when they compared that data, there was a one-to-one -one match. And that's that graph that you can see there in the center. And so it basically opened up a whole new world of going back to, to Mars to look for evidence of, you know, other types of meteorites or, you know, the kind of processes that exist here on Earth or potentially life. And that's and the same goes with identifying some of these organic compounds. And some of you may have actually heard about this mission. It's called OSIRIS-REx, um, literally just on Sunday, landed in the Utah desert. Um, the, the capsule has been delivered to JSC. We're going to basically compare the meteorites that we've recovered from Antarctica and everything we know about them against actual material that we've recovered from an asteroid. Um, I also want to point out, it's really kind of fun, uh, a lot of my friends are basically working on this mission, including the actual um, mission PI, his name is Dante Loretta, he and I actually went to Antarctica in 2002. So for me, a lot of this has come completely full circle. And so I'm going to leave you with two more slides. These are the last two slides, and then I'm going to be super excited to take all your questions, just to show you a little bit of some of the fun that we can occasionally have in Antarctica. Uh, this is a, what we call a Nansen sled. This is another essentially heritage a uh, piece of equipment from the early, literally from the turn of the century. The, the design is from like 1910, hasn't changed, and we still use them basically to transport all our gear on the ice. Uh, we're literally making a sailboat. Uh, this is somewhere around midnight, and uh, it worked so well. We left camp probably within, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. And I, I'm telling the driver, his name was Matt. I said, Matt, we're, we're moving really fast. I think you might have to go back and uh, get a skidoo and haul us back the other direction because the wind only blows one way. And uh, with that, I will take your questions and thank you for watching. Very, very cool. Thank you so, so much, Linda. What an incredible journey of what it actually looks like to do Antarctic research on the ice. That was the most in-depth we've ever had in any of our broadcasts. So I really, really appreciate that. And as you said, we're going to dive in with questions. we got a bunch of classes joining us from St. Catharines. we got Ms. Hunter. we got Mr. Schwarren's class on YouTube, uh, our Robinson Secondary in Virginia, and Mr. Lavogues in North Palm Beach in Florida. So I'm going to head to them first, our six through eight astronomy crew. If you guys want to dive in with the first question, uh, you're in the broadcast and good to go. Hey, guys. All right. So all, right all right. Go ahead. Ask your question. How big does an asteroid have to be? A meteorite. Meteorite. Or meteorite for it to get through our atmosphere. Ooh. Ooh. We have anything from microscopic particles that, that basically form the shooting stars that you see randomly every night to objects like the one I showed you at the very beginning that like are essentially cometary size. 
those, the big ones are very, very, very rare. Um, and we probably lose somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of the material as it's passing through uh, Earth's atmosphere. It's, it's moving very fast. And so a lot of friction builds up, you know, from Earth's atmosphere, which is very dense, and it causes a lot of that to basically sort of melt away. But yeah, we can have any and all sizes. Which I, I did a program last year on meteorites landing on Earth, and it's quite astonishing how much lands on Earth every day. And the majority yeah. is really, really tiny. Our shooting stars are just things burning up in our atmosphere, which is amazing at any age when you learn that. Um, yes. Great question to kick us off. Um, oh, Miss Tigney's class, our Robinson Secondary School crew, 11, 12. You guys are usually really reluctant to ask questions at that age. But if you have one for us, I'll come on in and you're good to go. Welcome in, folks. Hi. You got to unmute, though. More fun to talk to you when the mic is on, I find. It's like <laughs> my favorite part. Okay, Kylie. Oh, hey, guys. How many meteorites have you collected in Antarctica? Oh, what? <laughs> ah, so, so that's a fun question. One of the things that, that we, we go in as a team and we collect all the meteorites as a team. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I have no idea how many I've collected. For the two seasons that I went... The first uh, time I went, uh, we collected, um, I don't know, a little over 600. And the wow. second time I went, it was closer to 1,000. Yeah. And again, compared to 13,000 all over the rest of the world, like, I mean, yeah. this, that's astonishing. It's such a it amazing. Thank you very much for sharing that. Great question, guys. Thanks yeah. for a uh, late high school class to ask a question like instantly, like unheard of. So I like you guys so much more already. Uh, Ms. Schwarz's class, our Skaha Lake crew in Penticton, they got some great questions, including this one. Why is it dangerous for others if you get too cold? What? That sounds kind of counterintuitive. Because essentially all activities have to stop to focus on the person that, that basically gets cold. Um, I will tell you a story. So the second time that I went, we were commuting. And commuting um, seems like it would be really easy or driving around on a skidoo. But because you're not moving around and you're not eating a lot, you get cold. And so we ended up having to stop in the middle of our commute and put up a tent and get that person in there and get them warm, which means that now everybody else is waiting and potentially we're using up fuel. We're basically very limited in the amount of material and amount of fuel and food and everything else that we have. Plus, again, getting someone to come in to potentially remove someone who is dangerously cold um, is a, essentially is a, a, a mission ending activity. Yeah. Uh, there's very few places on this planet that you really require prep where nothing can go wrong or else you're in big trouble. So deep sea expeditions, yeah. space expeditions, Antarctica, like the people that go and do these things don't mess around because it's so important to each individual person, but the entire team, the work that you're doing, that that prep is done in advance. So I love that question. Thanks, guys in BC. St. Catharines, my old homestead. Uh, we got two classes joining together in our, my lovely former town. They wanted to know, why do you choose the profession? Have you always loved space? What's the deal? And that, Okay. Remember I say serendipity a lot? That's because uh, I'd say that most of my career is somewhat serendipitous. Obviously, you know, self-propelled at some level. I am a geologist. Um, I, I, the, the effort that I put into managing the minerals and the gems for the new geology hall, basically, it gave me domain knowledge that I could use to basically become the meteorite collection manager. Uh, meteorites themselves are rocks. So if you know something about rocks and how rocks are formed, I mean, meteorites are not that different from compositionally from the material we find here on Earth. They're just put together very different. Um, they record lots of other things. I could go into that all day. But long story short is it was on the job training. I also love that you highlighted at the beginning this like nerdy collecting phase. It's astonishing how many of the people that we bring on this broadcast are nerdy collectors. Like it's really quite joyous uh, at every stage of your life. So thank you for that. Great question, guys in St. Catharines. We're going to do another round with our live classes, take as many as we can from YouTube. But I'm going to head to Miss Digby's class first. I know high school is a little bit of a tighter timeline. So come on back in, unmute your mic, and you're good to go. <laughs> Hello. Yes, you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So, um, what the meteorites from our country that tell us about the Earth, Moon, and Mars? I'm sorry, say that again. <clears throat> so, uh, what? The, so basically, the meteorites from Antarctica, what they tell us about the Earth, Moon, and Mars? 
Why do they tell us about oh. the moon and Mars? Yes, oh, I don't okay. even know this. Okay. That the thing that we can tell that something comes from Mars is like amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. So for the moon and Mars, they basically capture information that ex that how how those those bodies formed very early on. Most of the Martian meteorites that we have in our collection, believe it or not, were launched off the surface of Mars, you know, millions of years ago. Um, they were also, interestingly enough, excavated from deep below Mars surface. And so they also give us an idea, a, a window into what the inside of Mars was like. Um, and the moon essentially was part of, you know, it formed right around the same time as Earth was forming. And so we basically get pieces of, you know, parts of the moon that we actually haven't sampled with the Apollo mission. So it also gives us another broader idea of the composition of the moon and some of the events that took place on the moon. And in terms of Earth, I'll show you this. This is not a very pretty one. This is an iron meteorite that fell in Arizona. This is Campo de Cielo, or I mean, um, Canyon Diablo, not Campo de Cielo. Anyway, we look at asteroidal material as analogs for material that we can't either get to on Earth or maybe the material that Earth started with before it evolved into the planet that it is today. Yeah, it's so, so cool. And worth noting too, with Mars, we haven't brought back rocks from Mars. Like we've landed things on Mars. There's a planned mission to bring back rocks from Mars, but the only Martian rocks that we have on Earth are meteorites, which again, something smashes into Mars, knocks stuff off, that stuff flies across the cosmos, lands on Earth, and we can find it and identify it is incredible. One of the coolest feats of modern science. The moon, you might know this, Linda. Do we have more moon rock from meteorites on Earth than we do from the Apollo missions? Or uh, several hundred pounds was brought back from Apollo. Is there a... Um, no, I, we probably have more Apollo material than okay. we have lunar material. That said, we have a greater diversity of lunar material in the meteorite collections than we do from the Apollo material. Very, very cool. By the way, I encourage all our classes when you're done this broadcast and you don't know how the moon formed or are pretty sure that happened. It's one of the most amazing things in all of science and it's a great follow-up to this program. Mr. Lavogue, I'm heading back to you live. I'm going to take one or two more from YouTube after that and then we're going to wrap up as time flies and you're having fun. Uh, Come on back in, astronomy crew. Hi, guys. All right, thanks. Go ahead, Betty. All right, uh, what kind of material of meteorites did you normally find in Arizona? Ooh. Yeah. Ah. So most of the meteorites that we recover in Antarctica belong to a particular group that we call chondrites. Um, chondrites are essentially rep represent a period of, of the formation of the solar system and materials that never became planets. And a lot of the original sort of gas and dust before the planets formed essentially are the residues um, from that period. And so a lot of that material is what we end up recovering. And probably maybe, you know, every year we find one or two among all the meteorites that are picked up, even among all those ordinary chondrites, one or two that are brand new to science. Um, and then a few of the, the odd, odd man outs that, that basically help us sort of fill in the gaps in, that, in the puzzle that's the earliest history of our solar system. Great question, guys. All right, we're going to take some really rapid fire ones from YouTube. Uh, biggest and largest meteorite ever recovered in Antarctica? This big, this big, bigger than me? What's going on? Okay, there, I, I think, think there is so the the in uh big Lou, 1986 there was a meteorite that was found literally on a mountain and it and it's i don't know i can't even describe how big it is it would it would basically fill the good portion of the space behind me um i think that might be the very biggest one and it has its own case in nasa where people can go and look at it it's kind of fun big Lou oh, is what it's I'm, called. i'm hopping on the next plane i think i gotta come see that <laughs> Uh, we're going to head back to Fairfax. Like, unheard of. Linda, you're you're so inspiring. We've gotten three questions from 1112. It's just unheard of. It's amazing. Come on back in, guys. Hey. It's sort of a backtrack to sort of experiences in Antarctica, <laughs> but have you ever had to have, like, an emergency supply drop into your camp, or have you <laughs> always come with <laughs> um, Not an emergency supply drop. Uh, the first time I went, we actually were close enough to McMurdo to have uh, some resupply. And I can't remember them. It might have actually been either something in when I, okay, just to sort of back it up for a second. The first time I went, we had one satellite phone for all the tents um, and, and very primitive solar panels that we used to charge it up. But the second time I went, we had satellite phones for all the tents. So the, the technology has advanced quite a bit. 
if you have problems with radio contact, that is essentially an emergency in which they will come out and drop things off to make sure that they can, can keep that connection because the PI has to, actually the PI and the safety officer have to talk to McMurdo every day. I'm really glad we got this kind of question. And again, we have a cave diver coming on next week. We've got some astronauts coming on next week. Uh, if you need to have an emergency supply drop or emergency anything, you not necessarily that you've done something wrong, but you probably haven't planned for a lot of contingencies that might happen in a challenging environment. So I'm glad to hear you've been so far in the clear. I'm going to take one more from YouTube. Uh, we can take questions all day. There's more questions than we can possibly mm -hmm. take in a live broadcast, which is a great problem to have. Um, easy one. Oh, actually, you know what? The two from this group. Have you ever found something really interesting that you weren't looking for? You're out looking for meteorites and there's a, a rogue polar bear that's made his way south for some reason. What's the deal? Um, we didn't, but the same year that I went, uh, one of the teams um, that uh, in this place called La Paz actually found a fossil. Um, they found bones and it turns out it was a, a, a um, prehistoric uh, seagull that, that had actually emerged up out of the ice. Um, they, they logged it. And then the following year they got permission and, and instructions from biologists how to go and collect it so they could bring it back. I'm going to just put this up as a banner to everyone. When you're done this, if you're like, if you like the polls, if you like Antarctica, it's not specific to meteorite work, but frozen planet two is one of the best documentaries ever made. Some of the coolest footage on earth ever. Uh, check that out when you're done, just skip all your classes, go do that when you're uh, finished today. Linda, this has been so much fun. I want to stress people can find out more about your work, your art focus uh, on your website there. You do some great work at Rice. Uh, it's so nice to have a chance to talk to a science communicator who's done this for so many years in such a positive way. Um, huge thank you to our classes on YouTube live with us. And what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in Ms. Digby's class and Mr. Laveau's class to say a big thank you and farewell. We're looking hey, forward hey, to having hey, you hey, back anytime. Hey. For now, hey. have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much. Hey, Bye. Hey, Bye. Hey, Bye. Hey, Bye. Hey,